Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, we're continuing our lecture on the cell for our MCAT biology playlist. Last time we talked about microscopes and the cell theory. We talked about uh, similarities and differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We looked at a bacteria cell and, and talked about the components and organelles that make up the bacterial cell. Then we looked at plant and animal cells, which are examples of eukaryotic cells, and we kind of compared and contrasted them. Today, we're going to go back to eukaryotic cells, and we're going to begin delving into the specifics of certain organelles. And we're going to start by mentioning how eukaryotic cells' genetic instructions are housed in the nucleus and carried out by ribosomes. And so we're going to look at two cellular components involved in the genetic control of the cell, which is the nucleus. It houses most of the cell's DNA and the ribosomes, which use information from DNA to make proteins. <clears throat> now, the nucleus, the nucleus contains most of the genes in the eukaryotic cell. And I only say most and not all because some genes are located in the mitochondria and some in the chloroplast for plant cells. Now, it is generally the most conspicuous organelle, averaging about 5 micrometers in diameter. And then you have the nuclear envelope that encloses the nucleus, and it separates its contents from the cytoplasm. This nuclear envelope is a double membrane. All right, the two membranes, we can zoom in in here, the two membranes, each a lipid bilayer with associated proteins, are actually separated by a space that's about 20 to about 40 nanometers. The envelope has these pore structures that are about 100 nanometers in diameter, and at the lip of each pore, the inner and outer membrane of the nuclear envelope are kind of like continuous. Now, except at the pores, the nuclear side of the envelope is said, is said to be lined by the nuclear lamina. So this is like a net-like array of protein filaments that help maintain the shape of the nucleus by supporting the nuclear envelope mechanically. Now, there's also much evidence for nuclear matrix. So this is a framework of protein fibers that extend throughout the nuclear interior. And the nuclear lamina and the matrix, they pretty much help organize the genetic material so that it functions properly. Now, within the nucleus, um, the DNA is organized into these discrete units called chromosomes. They're structures that carry genetic information. Each chromosome carries one long DNA molecule that's associated with many proteins. And these proteins, they help coil the DNA molecule of each chromosome so that it can reduce its length and allow it to fit into the nucleus. Each eukaryotic species has a characteristic number of chromosomes. So for example, a, a typical human cell has 46 chromosomes in their nucleus. The only exception to that are our sex cells, so our eggs and sperm only have 23 chromosomes in humans. Now, ribosomes, ribosomes are complexes that are made out of ribosomal RNA and protein. Um, they are cellular components that carry out protein synthesis. And so what happens here is that the DNA, the, the, the genes that are encoded in your chromosomes, they code for, the, the, for pro certain proteins, and your, your ribosomes are the cellular components that are going to carry out said protein synthesis. And actually, the process of going from you know, DNA in the nucleus to the formation of proteins includes a process of replication, transcription, and translation, which we're going to cover in depth later down the line. But the, po the, the main point to take home here is that these ribosomes are the cellular components that carry out protein synthesis. All right. Now, with that being said, we also want to talk about the mitochondria. The mitochondria is often called the power plant or the powerhouse of the cell. And this is in reference to their important metabolic functions. Um, the mitochondria, it has two layers, the outer and inner membrane. The outer membrane 
Um, it serves as, let me see if I have a picture. I don't have a picture. Oh, here we are, the mitochondria. All right. It has an inner and outer membrane. The outer membrane, it serves as a barrier between the cytosol and then the inner environment. Um, and the inner membrane, which is thrown into these numerous infoldings called cristae, they contain the molecules and enzymes that are necessary for the electron transport chain. The cristae are really highly convoluted structures that are going to increase the surface area available for electron transport chain enzymes. Now the space, the space between the inner and outer membranes, this is called the intermembrane space. All right. It's the space inside the inner and, and the space inside the inner membrane. This has a name as well. It's called the mitochondrial matrix. All right. So mitochondria powerhouse of the cell. This is where cellular respiration happens. And so it's, it's the place where a lot of ATP is made. Hence the name powerhouse of the cell. Now I'm going to go back here for one quick second. All right, because we actually also want to talk about the endomembrane system. The endomembrane system, it regulates protein traffic and it performs metabolic functions in cells. Many, diff many of the different membranes of the eukary eukaryotic cell are part of the endomembrane system. And this includes the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, various kinds of vesicles and vacuoles, um, and even the plasma membrane. This system, it carries out a variety of tasks in the cell. This includes things like synthesis of proteins, transport of proteins into membranes and organelles or out of the cell even. It involves metabolism and movement of lipids and detoxification of poisons. The membranes of the system are going to be related either through direct physical continuity or by the transfer of membrane segments as tiny vesicles. And despite these relations, though, despite their relationships, the various membranes that are not identical in structure and function. And so it goes without saying that it's important that we cover each component of this endomembrane system and what it is, uh, what its role in the cell is. And so we start off with the endoplasmic reticulum. All right, this is an extensive network of membranes. Um, and it accounts for more than half of the total membranes in many eukaryotic cells. There are two distinct regions of the endoplasmic reticulum. They are connected, but they're two distinct regions. They differ in structure and function, and they are the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is named this way because its outer surface lacks ribosomes, whereas the rough endoplasmic reticulum is studded with ribosomes on the outer surface. Now, as we said, ribosomes are um, the place where protein synthesis occurs. They're also attached to the cytoplasmic side of the nuclear envelope's outer membrane, which is continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what are the functions of rough endoplasmic reticulum? Well, many cells secrete proteins that are produced by ribosomes that are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. In addition to making uh, um, proteins or secretion proteins, rough endoplasmic reticulum is a membrane factory for the cell. So it grows in place by adding membrane proteins and phospholipids to its own membrane. Now, the rough endoplasmic reticulum also makes membrane phospholipids and enzymes built into the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. They assemble phospholipids from pre precursors in the cytosol. The endoplasmic reticulum membrane can expand and portions of it can sometimes be transferred in the form of transport vesicles to other components of the endomembrane system. Now, what about the smooth endoplasmic reticulum? All right. It has no ribosomes, unlike the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and some of the things that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is in charge of is synthesis of lipids, metabolism of carbohydrates, detoxification of drugs and po poisons, and also storage of calcium ions. 
The enzymes of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they're important in the synthesis of lipids, things like oils, steroids, and even new membrane phospholipids. Um, some other enzymes in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum are going to help detoxify drugs and poisons, especially in the liver cells. Um, it also stores calcium ions, which is really important. In muscle cells, for example, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to pump calcium ions from the cytosol into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. And when a muscle cell is stimulated by a nerve impulse, calcium ions are going to rush back across the endoplasmic membrane into the cytosol, and that's going to trigger um, contraction of the muscle cell. So clearly, a lot of functions, a lot of uh, that, a lot of functions happen in both the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum that are extremely important in helping the cell um, stay alive, helping the cell regulate many things. Now, in addition, let's define the role of other organelles in this category. Right? We said not it wasn't just the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum that are part of the endomembrane system, but the Golgi apparatus is another organelle in this category. Now, after leaving the endoplasmic reticulum, many transport vesicles actually will travel to the Golgi apparatus. We can think of the Golgi apparatus as a warehouse for receiving, sorting, shipping, and even sometimes manufacturing things that the cell needs. So here, the products of the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, like proteins, can be modified, stored, and then sent to other destinations that need them. This Golgi apparatus, it consists of these flattened mem uh, membrane sacs. We call them um, cisternate. They, they, they kind of look like a stack of pita breads. <laughs> um, a cell can have many or hundreds of these stacks. The Golgi stack also has some distinct structural di directionality. All right, With the membranes of the cisternate on opposite sides of the stack, they kind of differ in thickness and molecular composition. And so you can say that there's two sides all right, there's two sides of a Golgi stack. They're referred to as the cis face and the trans face. Um, they, the, these act respectively as the receiving and the shipping department on, of the Golgi apparatus. Um, the term cis means um, on the same side. And so the cis face obviously faces um, uh, near the, the endoplasmic reticulum. So transport vesicles can move material from the endoplasmic reticulum to this cis side of the Golgi apparatus where they're accepted and taken in. Um, a vesicle that buds from the ER can then add its membrane and the contents of its lumen to the cis face by fusing with the Golgi membrane. Now the trans face on the opposite side, it gives rise to vesicles that pinch off and then will travel to other sides. Now, in addition to the Golgi apparatus, the lysosome, um, is also part of the endomembrane um, system. It's a, a, membrane, uh, a membrane sac of hydrolytic enzymes that many eukaryotic cells use to digest macromolecules. Um, the lysosomes um, help break down macromolecules, so it's very important for that. There's another one um, thing that I want to make mention here that is part of the endomembrane system typically found in plant cells, and those are vacuoles. These are large vesicles derived from the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. They're in, um, like all cellular membranes, they're very selective in transporting solutes. As a result, the solution inside a vacuole differs in composition from the cytosol. Um, they're found in plant cells, and they sometimes just store materials for later use as well. So, so far we've defined the nucleus, we've defined ribosomes, we've talked about the mitochondria, we've talked about the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, um, and the mitochondria. Um, and so with that, those are a lot of important characteristics in organelles that are found in the cell. Now, one thing I want to refocus on is we talk about the mitochondria, but also the chloroplast here since we haven't. Um, and we're going to see how the mitochondria and the chloroplast change energy from one form to another. So to prop this, this, this objective up, organisms, they transform energy, right? They, they transform the energy they acquire from their surroundings. In eukaryotic cells, mitochondria and chloroplasts are the organelles that are going to convert energy to forms that cells can use for work. Mitochondria, like we said earlier, they're the sites of cellular respiration. 
which is the metabolic process that's going to use oxygen to drive generation of ATP by extracting, by extracting energy from sugars, fats, and other fuels. Chloroplasts, which are found in plants and algae, they're the sites of photosynthesis. This process uh, in chloroplasts, it'll, it's going to convert solar energy to chemical energy by absorbing sunlight and using it to drive the synthesis of organic compounds like sugars from carbon dioxide and water. Now, in addition to having related function, mitochondria and chloroplasts, they have a pretty similar evolutionary origin. Mitochondria and chloroplasts, they display similarities with bacteria. And that similarity led to the development of this endosymbiont theory. And this theory states that early ancestor of eukaryotic cells actually engulfed an oxygen using non-photosynthetic prokaryotic cell. And eventually the engulfed cell, it formed a relationship with the host cell in which it was enclosed, becoming endosymbiont. Um, so it's like a cell living within another cell. And over the course of the evolution, the host cell and this merged prokaryotic cell, they form this endosymbiotic relationship. Um, and now it's what we see it as is a eukaryotic cell with a mitochondria. All right. So that prokaryotic cell was engulfed into a eukaryotic cell and it forms it formed the mitochondria. So that's that's one possible theory to um, the evolutionary origins of mitochondria and, and, and chloroplasts as well. So that's a very interesting thing to keep in mind, how they share evolutionary origin. Now, we've talked about the function of mitochondria. Um, they're, they're the powerhouse of the cell. So this is where ATP um, formation occurs through cellular respiration. Cellular respiration um, is, 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 is a process that forms ATP. It involves glycolysis followed by Krebs cycle, followed by electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. And actually, if you want to learn more about that, I have a whole video on that in my biology playlist that you can reference. Chloroplasts are where photosynthesis happens. Um, and I also have a, a, a video describing the process of photosynthesis in my biology playlist that you can reference. And I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about it in this MCAT biology playlist as well eventually. But in case you want to just cut to the chase, those videos are already up in the biology playlist. Fantastic. Now, with that, we can start to talk about another important part of the cell, and that's the cytoskeleton. All right, the cytoskeleton is a network of fibers that organize structure and activities in the cell. The eukaryotic cytoskeleton, it plays a major role in organizing the structure and activities of the cell. And it is composed of three types of molecular structures. These are microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Now, the most obvious function of the cytoskeleton is to give mechanical support to the cell and to maintain its shape. This is especially important for animal cells which lack cell walls. All right, they have plasma membranes, but they don't have cell walls like plant cells do. Now, the remarkable strength and resilience of the cytoskeleton as a whole is based on its architecture. The cytoskeleton is stabilized by a balance between opposing forces exerted by its elements. And the cytoskeleton, it provides anchorage for many organelles and even for cytosolic enzyme molecules. It's a very dynamic skeleton. Um, and the cytoskeleton is more dynamic um, than, than an animal skeleton, actually. It can be quickly dismantled in one part of the cell and, res, uh, and reassembled in a new location, changing the shape of the cell. Imagine if our skeletons did that. We could just shapeshift. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Um, now, some types of cell motility um, and, and movement also involve this, the, the use of the, cell skeleton, uh, the cytoskeleton. And of course, it requires this, the cytoskeleton to interact with, with motor proteins to make that possible. Now, what we want to do is really look closely and talk 
in detail about this these three main types of fibers that make up the cytoskeleton so we want to talk about microtubules microfilaments and of course intermediate filaments now microtubules are the thickest of the three types microfilaments are the thinnest and we could do that these are the thickest my uh microfilaments they're the thinnest and as the name suggests for intermediate filaments they're kind of an intermediate size they're kind of they kind of fall in the middle range between microtubules and microfilaments all right now all eukaryotic cells have microtubules um, these are hollow rods that are constructed from global uh, globular proteins called tubulin each tubulin protein is a dimer which is a molecule made out of two subunits the tubulin dimer it consists of two slightly different polypeptides called alpha tubulin and beta tubulin these microtubules they grow in length by adding tubulin dimers and they can also be disassembled um, and their tubulin used to build microtubules elsewhere in the cell now because of the orientation of tubulin dimers the two ends of microtubules can sometimes be different, slightly different. They are slightly different. One end can accumulate or release tubulin dimers at much higher rate than the other, thus growing and shrinking significantly during cellular activities. Now, microtubules shape and support the cell, and they also serve as tracks along which organelles equipped with motor proteins can move. All right, so in summary, all right, in summary, microtubules are composed of tubulin. They create pathways for motor proteins like kinesins and dynes to carry vesicles. They also contribute to the structure of cilia and flagella, which help with movement. And they're organized into nine pairs of microtubules in a ring with two microtubules at the center. This is called the nine plus two structure. And centrioles are found in the centrosomes, and they're involved in microtubule organization in the my mitotic spindle. All right. Now, now this thing that I mentioned, how um, uh, cilia and flagella, these are mo uh, mobile structures that are motile structures composed of microtubules. They have this nine plus two structure where you have um, you have nine pairs of microtubules forming an outer ring, and then there's two microtubules in the center. All right, so it's called this nine plus two structure, and it's seen only in eukaryotic organelles of motility like cilia and flagella. All right, so that's microtubules. What about microfilaments? These are thin, solid uh, rods. Um, they are also filaments because they are built from, uh, they're called uh, calodactin filaments because they're built from molecules of actin which is a globular protein microfilament is a twisted double chain of actin subunits and they're present in all eukaryotic cells they help shape and support um, the cell and they also have a role in cell motility um, so in short, micro microfilaments are composed of actin. They provide structural protection for the cell. They can cause muscle contraction through interactions with, with myosin. They help form the cleavage furrow during cytokinesis and mitosis, which we'll cover in the next chapter as well. All right, and last but not least, we can talk about intermediate filaments. Um, they're named for their diameter, which is larger than the diameter of microfilaments, but smaller than that of microtubules. Now, unlike microtubules and microfilaments, which are found in all eukaryotic cells, intermediate filaments are only found in the cells of some animals. Um, they're specialized for bearing tension, um, and they're a diverse class of cytoskeletal elements. Um, and so, with that being said, keep in mind, Intermediate filaments are involved also in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion or, and or the maintenance of the integrity of the cytoskeleton. They can also help anchor organelles. Some examples of intermediate filaments are keratin and desmin. All right, and here we have a really good um, table that summarizes the structure and function of the cytoskeleton. So you can see here microtubules, they're made out of tubulin polymers, alpha and beta types. Um, they're hollow tubes. Um, they have a 25 nanometer diameter. Um, 
and their main function is maintenance of cell shape, motility, um, and organelle movements. And here we see microfilaments. They're made out of actin. Um, they're two intertwined strands of actin. They're seven nanometers in diameter. They help maintain cell shape, changes in cell shape, muscle contraction, cell motility, and cell division as well. And then last but not least, we have intermediate filaments. They're made out of keratin proteins. Um, they are fibrous proteins that, that are super coiled into thicker cables. Their diameters are between 8 and 12 nanometers, um, and they maintain, maintain cell shape. They anchor organelles, and they help in the formation of nuclear lamina. All right. And here we can also see a little bit of a, a close-up for microtubules, how we say they're a hollow tube formed from tubulin dimers. And you can see this where there's an interchange of alpha and beta tubulin. Same with microfilaments. It's a double helix of actin monomers. So you can see that double helix structure here of actin monomers. And intermediate filaments, they're composed of strong fibers, um, composed of intermediate filamel, filamer, filament, sorry, protein subunits. And you can see how these structures are kind of made here for the intermediate filaments. All right. And quick points to keep in mind. Microfilaments are composed of actin, protection, muscle contraction, cleavage furo. Microtubules are composed of tubulin, motor protein, cilia and flagella. And then we have intermediate filaments involved in cell to cell adhesion and cytoskeleton. So these are very important to keep in mind. Hence why I feel the need to repoint, uh, repeat these points to you so that they stick. All right. With that, I'm going to end this chapter here. We'll, conti we'll, we'll continue um, next time in the next lecture with talking about the three domains of life, as well as um, a little bit more information about bacteria. All right. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.